A warm welcome to this talk. It's Sunday the 14th of August 2022. Now I'm going to be talking about depression today because there's some new research from the Journal of Molecular Psychiatry that basically tells me that what I've been teaching for the past 25-30 years is wrong and, and what people have believed for the past 25-30 years has, has been wrong. We've been getting this wrong. And this is related to serotonin and depression. Now, for all these decades, we've been teaching and working on the assumption that depression was caused by the lack of serotonin. In other words, the lack of this serotonin neurotransmitter, this chemical transmitter in the brain. The lack of this serotonin is what was depressing mood, deficiency, depression. Deficiency of serotonin causes depressed mood, causes depression. And that makes perfect sense, apart from the fact that it's wrong. And this paper in Molecular Psychiatry gives quite a, a few different strands of evidence to show that there's actually no relationship between the levels of serotonin and depression. We've been getting it wrong. Now, where does this leave us before we look at the, the, the physiology of what's going on? Where does this leave us in terms of the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, the antidepressants that uh, work by increasing the amount of serotonin? Now, the the, these antidepressants, these Prozac type drugs, these selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors do inhibit the uptake of serotonin, but it now appears that that's nothing to do with depression. And yet there's independent evidence that these antidepressants do work. Now, if you're taking these antidepressants at the moment, obviously carry on taking them exactly as your doctor has prescribed until you see your doctor for further discussions to see what he wants to do with your treatment. But the point, the point is, these drugs can't be working in the way that we thought they worked if it's right that the depression is not caused by a lack of serotonin. Now, the evidence shows that these drugs do work. It just means they're working in a completely different way to what we'd assumed. What that is, we haven't got a clue. So we're kind of back to square one where we were in the 60s, really. We don't know really what is causing depression in terms of, of neurochemistry. We, we really don't know. Now, um, that's what this is about. So if you're interested, stick around. Um, it's not an easy listen, um, but I'll do my best. Uh, if you're not interested, then th thank you for staying this long and I hope that helps. If you are leaving us now, then just remember that uh, a lot of medicine is uncertain and we need to constantly change it in the light of new evidence. Just take that as your takeaway message. Now, what we have... Imagine that this is a nerve fibre here coming down and this nerve fibre will actually broaden out into a broader area here uh, before this microscopic gap called the synapse and of course this is all on a totally microscopic scale. So the nerve impulse would be coming down here and it wants to get onto this next nerve uh, fibre and there's a physical gap here between this and the next nerve fibre. This is called the synaptic gap or the synaptic cleft that I'm sure you've heard of. And then this carries on and goes and does something else stimulating some other part of the brain, for example. Now, what happens is that the serotonin, the transmitter, is made in this side of the uh, synaptic gap here and stored in vesicles. But it's not made in this side. So that means that if serotonin is needed to transmit the impulse from this side to this side, it can go from this presynaptic side to this postsynaptic side, but it can't go from the postsynaptic side back to the presynaptic side because there's no chemical transmitter made here to carry it. So remember, this is the this is always the direction of impulse here. It's in it's in this direction from the presynaptic side to the postsynaptic side, so the impulse can carry on. Now, what happens when a nerve impulse comes along is some of this serotonin is released and it diffuses across the synaptic gap here. And it's picked up by specific serotonin receptors on this side. And what, once these uh, receptors have serotonin in them, they will cause what we call a depolarization. They'll reverse the polarity of this neuron and the impulse will basically carry on. So the serotonin is made there. It's released at the presynaptic membrane here, diffuses across the gap, fits in with serotonin, receptors on this side and carries on. Now that bit is still true. We still believe that that bit is still true. Um, 
but it was believed that it was the lack of serotonin that caused the, uh, the, pre the depression. So what the drug manufacturers did, and it's quite clever really, they, they worked on a drug which inhibits the release of, uh, sorry, inhibits the reuptake of serotonin. So what normally happens is that once the serotonin has done its job and stimulated the postsynaptic membrane here, we don't want it continuously stimulating this postsynaptic membrane. Otherwise, we'd have too much activity here. That would mean that one nerve impulse there will give us about 100 nerve impulses there. So we need to get rid of it. So some of it's broken down by enzymes, an enzyme called monoamine oxidase. But a lot of it is simply just reabsorbed back into the presynaptic membrane like that. And that makes sense because it can be used again. It can be recycled. But selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors do just what it says on the tin. They select the serotonin. They stop it from being reup the, the reuptake of it. So they're selective serotonin. In other words, they're only working on the serotonin, but they reuptake reuptake inhibitors. So they are preventing the reuptake of inhibitor of uh, they're, re they're inhibiting the reuptake of the serotonin from the synaptic gap back into the presynaptic membrane. Now, if you're inhibiting the reuptake of serotonin, if you've got less serotonin going back into the presynaptic membrane, less is being reabsorbed. What's that going to do to the amount that's left in the synaptic gap? Well, if there's less being reabsorbed, it's going to increase that amount. So it increases this amount of serotonin. So there's more serotonin here. So we get more stimulation. And because de de depression was believed to be caused by lack of serotonin, increasing the serotonin, treats the depression. That's what was uh, believed. Now, um, what happens also is that some of the serotonin leaves the synaptic gap and it's broken down into a, a metabolite called 5H1, uh, 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 sorry, I, uh, H-I-A-A-A. -A -A. That's a metabolite. It's broken down into that. So if people, if, if, if people were short of um, serotonin, you would expect there to be less of this metabolite in people that have depression. Well, that's not the case. They, they don't have less of this metabolite. The, number, the, the amount of this metabolite is the same in people with depression and without depression. So that test is failed. And also some of the serotonin just gets out into the blood plasma. Not a lot because it's broken down fairly quickly. But again, you would expect if people were short of serotonin, you'd get less serotonin in the plasma in people that are depressed, uh, depressed. And again, you don't. So less serotonin there because people are depressed. Less serotonin in the plasma is what you'd expect. You don't actually see it, again, indicating there's not a shortage of serotonin in the in the synapse because there's a, it's, it's not transposed, transposed into, the, um, into the plasma. Uh, now, the third thing you would expect is a change in the receptors. Now, if we look at this membrane in a little more detail, we actually see that, imagine this is the presynaptic membrane here, just a blow up of the whole thing. And this is the postsynaptic membrane here. Now, these are, this postsynaptic membrane has specific receptor sites like this. And these are the receptor sites that receive the released molecules of serotonin. So the molecules of serotonin are released from here and they're received here. And if there was changes in the amount of serotonin, it's quite clever. What happens was if, if there's a shortage of serotonin, then the, the, the amount of these receptors will increase. There's an autoregulatory effect. So if depression was caused by a lack of serotonin you would expect to see a change in these receptors and, and again uh, you don't you don't see a change in these receptors the number of receptors here in the postsynaptic membrane that's the number of receptors here in this postsynaptic membrane we've drawn here stays the same so again that test is failed again indicating that depression is not caused by a lack of uh, serotonin now, another factor is that um, there's, there's a precursor for the, uh, for the serotonin called, called uh, tryptophan. It's an amino acid. So the, the tryptophan goes into here and uh, the tryptophan is converted by the body into the serotonin. 
So tryptophan is necessary for the production of serotonin. Therefore, if people were short of tryptophan, you would expect them to lose the ability to make serotonin. Therefore, you'd expect them to become depressed. And again, studies have shown that people that are depleted, these are called depletion studies, people that are depleted in the level of tryptophan, it doesn't change their level of, uh, it doesn't change their mood. It doesn't change their mood at all. So again, you would expect that. And there's, way, there's ways that you can limit tryptophan. What, what they tend to do is give drinks that have got all of the amino acids apart from tryptophan. But shortage of tryptophan doesn't lead to a reduction in mood in the vast majority of people. So again, um, it fails that test as well. Um, so tryptophan is not, lack of tryptophan is not, although lack of tryptophan may reduce the amount of serotonin, that is not affecting mood either. And the fifth line of evidence co comes from something called the, the CERT gene. Um, CERT. Now the CERT gene actually is... Um, a gene and what 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 it what it actually does is um the component the molecule on the presynaptic membrane which actually facilitates the reuptake of the uh, the serotonin is 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 that's called the cert molecule the cert molecule so there's been comprehensive genetic studies on people that have varying amounts of these uh people that have varying amounts of these cert molecules because again, you'd expect if there was more cert molecules, if there was more cert molecules, that would transport more serotonin from the gap back into the presynaptic membrane. Therefore, you'd have less serotonin here. Therefore, you'd have less stimulation there. Therefore, you'd expect more depression. And again, this simply doesn't happen. Variations in the cert molecule do not change uh, the level of uh, depression that people are. Uh, experiencing. So all this evidence put together indicates that depression is not caused by a lack of serotonin as we thought for all of these years and as I've taught for my entire uh, teaching career. Um, we basically got that wrong. Um, now the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, these antidepressant drugs, do work but it means they're working in a completely different way and we don't know what that way is, which is kind of interesting. But there again, we don't know how conscious is generated either. Uh, why am I conscious? How is that generated in the brain? How does the mind come out of the brain? No idea. If someone tells you, oh, I've got a good theory as to how consciousness is generated by the brain, don't believe them. We simply don't know how, how this happens. Basically, you have this part called the brain stem, which generates consciousness, whatever that is, and it's experienced in different parts of the brain. We don't understand that. And it, now it looks like we don't understand why some people become depressed. And again, anxiety is, is very associated with this as well. We don't know why this is, but it still seems that the antidepressants work. But what this means is that when we do understand how people actually become depressed, where we understand the real science that's going on here, then we could make a, a preparation which might be completely curative for uh, uh, generalised anxiety disorder and depression with possible knock-on effects on such things as obsessive-compulsive disorder, uh, anorexia nervosa. Uh, now, this study did include the psychoses. So you've probably heard of something called uh, manic depression or bipolar or bipolar affective psychosis, almost the same thing. People go manic where they sort of run around quickly doing all sorts of things that can harm themselves. Going into periods of depression, that, 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 that they are cyclothalmic. They vary between the two. This study did not, uh, did not look at that. That is a psychotic condition, whereas the depression it's looking at here is a neurotic condition. The difference being that a psychotic condition is where the mind, the change goes on in the mind and that affects the environment, whereas a neurosis is where the environment is affecting the mind. So it's looking like the modality, the, 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 the way that this is working. So if things are going bad in your life, the way that this is expressed in low mood is not related to serotonin. But of course, you can become depressed when things aren't going bad in your life as well. So there's obviously some neurochemical underlying process, just that we don't know what it is. And of course, if that increases our humility, I guess that can only be a, a good 
thing. Now I had prepared lots of notes on this. I'm not going to go through them all. It's kind of it, it kind of it's a bit bit mind blowing. It's a bit complicated. It's all ups and downs and sideways and increases in that mean decreases in the other. So I'm not going to put that on. Um, but I will paste them in the description. And uh, if people are interested, we can always do that. But of course, there's the link to the original study there. So there you go. Um, we don't know um, what causes depression. And we don't know that how selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors treat depression, but we do know that they can be very effective in depression for many people. And uh, that's an interesting one that you could talk over with your um, prescriber. And uh, thank you for watching.